This sucks. <clears throat> um, yeah, wow. Just like, what, four or five games ago, we were talking about playoffs again. All right, <clears throat> let's talk Yankees, episode 558. The Yankees obviously dropped the series to Milwaukee. <laughs> but um, they dropped something else. They lost something else during this series, which is kind of just taken over um, the theme of this episode in. You all know what we're going to talk about, so let's get to the intro. Let's start this thing up. Episode 558 of BD4. Let's go. Testing. Whoops. All right, so let's do it. Let's talk some Yankees, man. Uh, whoops, 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 whoops. Here we are. Um, shit, that was fucking brutal. Um, before we get into the thick of things, it is football season uh, because as I'm recording, it's Sunday, September 10th. Um, and um, tonight, you know, today... Was well, NFL Sunday the first NFL Sunday of the fucking 2023-2024 season? Um, I'm not into football, so forever for whoever is listening, if I even have anybody, any family members still listening to the podcast. Well, I guess they wouldn't, um, because they wouldn't know. So, family, I've had like family members over the last five years come up to me and talk to me about the New York Giants and ask me like, hey Rob, how are your Giants doing? Tell me about these Giants. What do you think about these Giants? And for some reason, like they all think I'm a Giants diehard. And this has gone on for like five, six years now where it's like I, I've had to keep reminding them, no, no, no. It's Yankees. It's Yankees Knicks. I'm not a New York Giants fan. Um, I've had aunts, I've had aunts, uncles, cousins who I don't see often, so I get it. But it's it's gotten to be so constant over the last five or so years. Where this last year, I've just kind of been just going with the flow. I'm like yeah, yeah, blah. <laughs> I like, stopped correcting people. Um, but you know, for the odd chance that any family member is listening to the show. Now, I mean, you should know if you listen to the show, but um, yes, I am Yankees Knicks. I am not much of a New York Giants fan. I follow them casually. I watch the games to a degree, uh, not a ton, well, not like I used to. I was big on the NFL back in like the 2000s and the early 2010s, but yes, uh, let me just get that out of the way. Also, I should probably get this out of the way. Um, I don't know if it's too late, but let me just get it out of the way for, for the future. If I get one single more request from a friend or anybody who knows me in life or just online gets in touch with me to join your stupid little pathetic fantasy football league, I'm probably going to block you. I'm probably never going to talk to you again. So let's not do that again. I am so sick and tired of people coming up to me and asking me for to join their fantasy football league. Again, these people know I don't even follow football. They know I hate fantasy football because I've made that known. And they still constantly talk to me about fantasy football as if I actually give a rat's cheek. I, it's just, it bugs the living shit out of me. 
I've had my buddy, and I'm going to call you out, Leo, just DM, DM me, part of like an eight, nine men group chat. Hey guys, the draft starts tonight at 8 p.m. Be there. I'm sorry. Did we just skip over the part where you requested me? I almost have respect for that. But I am, I'm like, I can't. This time of year, I know everybody loves football. I am the anti that. Uh, I love the time of year. I love Halloween season. I love how Sunday football family comes together. We, we all have fun, and that's great. But just the, the constant talk about receivers, this, that, stats, and oh man, that stuff is like listening to math. I can't bear it. So please, I don't follow the Giants like I do the Yankees and the Knicks, and I don't care about fantasy football. Last night was fun. Sean Strickland. How about that, huh? Wow. Sean's my favorite fighter. Um, <clears throat> He's my favorite fighter for a reason. Because he shoots the shit, does not care, and says whatever the hell he wants. And that's how I believe everybody should be. Um, I've always hated the whole have to be professional shtick. And you got to give this answer and be cliche and, and be fake. Basically, they're telling you to do on national TV and stuff. I love watching the UFC because you get personalities like Sean Strickland. So... I've always been a fan of him. I love him as a fighter because he doesn't care about the game inside the game. He doesn't care about going for a championship belt and having to win this fight against this ranked fighter and this. He doesn't care about that. He just wants to fight. He's not playing games. He's not there to do all that. He's just there to fight. That's what he enjoys doing. He enjoys beating the crap out of people and having the crap beat out of him. That's what he likes to do. And that's why I love Sean Strickland and... You know what? I'm his biggest fan, but to say that I expected him to do what he did last night to Izzy Adesanya, who is arguably the greatest middleweight of all time, if not right below Anderson Silva, that is that no, no, nobody did. I'm his biggest fan, and I and I, I was saying I, I expected him to get knocked out in the first. I'm not gonna lie to you, but Sean Strickland proved me and everybody else wrong who doubted him last night. He proved DraftKings wrong who had him at plus 600 or something like that. And he looked tremendous from the get-go. He made Izzy Adesanya look scared. Izzy was the, uh, the the opposite of aggressive. He was on his heels the entire fight. Sean pressured him. Sean was just going... And Sean doesn't hit extremely hard, but he gets you with volume. Jab, jab, jab. He just kept pushing Izzy against, against the fence. And he just, all night, just pressuring him. Jabs, adding up. Izzy's face was beat up by the end of the night. Sean looked like he didn't even have a fight. It was an unbelievable performance, and Sean Strickland's defense was just artwork. An excellent display of defense from Sean Strickland. He did not get touched. Um, it was awesome to see. And you could argue he won all five rounds. I had him four rounds to one. The only swing round, not swing round, the only round that you could say Izzy took was round three. But you could make a case that was Sean's too. Um, and I was keeping score during the fight. And I'm usually terrible at scorekeeping, but this one, I nailed it. I, I think I had whatever the, I think 49, 46. I had the exact uh, score that the uh, judges had. Izzy will be fine. Chinese champion will bounce back. Um, but this is Sean's time right now. It is the Sean Strickland era. It is the loudmouth era. You know, we got Sean O'Malley up there uh, holding a belt. We got Sean Strickland and now Colby Covington hopefully can be the next one with Usman seeming to be on the decline. Leon Edwards is there right now, I believe. We'll see what happens. I'm not too high on him maintain keeping that belt, but it's fun, man. This is going to be a fun era. Someone who talks shit, says whatever the hell he wants. If You know, I have always made this, I don't know what to call it, a contrast. Uh, why I love the UFC way more than I love the MLB and the NBA and the NFL. Um, not really talking about the sport, but just the league. Is because Dana White lets his fighters, lets his athletes say whatever the hell they want. He lets them have free speech up there and you can't really say the same 
about other sports where this goes back to again what we were saying how you have to pretend to be all professional and you got to say cliches and you got to be all fake like if sean strickland said the shit he does in the ufc in the nba he would be painted as adolf hitler are you kidding me look at the way Kyrie's being treated for just speaking shit <laughs> but like the ufc the UFC media, the UFC fans, they're not snowflakes. They don't care what you say. They may not agree. They might think it's outrageous, but they don't go crying to social media. They they, they shrug it off. That kid, uh, Manel Cop, saying what he said, a little slur. Okay, yeah, not cool, but who cares? Move on. It's a word. It's a, it's a word. Move on. You say shit, you get over it. Everybody pretends to be outraged because their neighbor is outraged. But that's why I like the UFC, because nobody gives a shit. We just went on a 20, what felt like 20 minute rant, uh, about nothing to do with baseball. Um, so we'll start talking baseball. <clears throat> As I take a sip of my drink. <coughs> Saturday, uh, which was game two of the series, we had Old Timers Day. It was pretty cool, man. Uh... I still wish they played the Old Timers Day. They took that away. Uh, but this was cool to see Jeter there. It was Jeter's first time at Old Timers Day. We saw him. We saw Matsui. Uh, man, are we getting old. It's crazy. Like, those guys are now Old Timers. When I was growing up, Old Timers were the guys from all, you know, from the 70s and the 90s and those guys. Like, no, it's the old timers are now starting to become guys from the 2000s, guys from the 2010s. It's nuts. We're getting old. Uh, they don't look old though. Jeter looks. Jeter looks the same. Matsui looks the same. Posada looks the same. Mariano Rivera could probably go out there and, there and still pitch. I know that's that's very cliche, but he probably could. I mean, he went out on top with, with 40 something saves. He could probably still throw that cutter just as effectively at 85 miles an hour. Um, it was cool seeing Willie Adamas meet Derek Jeter. That clip has been going viral. That was pretty cool. He goes up and meets him, tries to keep his cool, and the second he walks away, he's like, you know, like a little kid. That was pretty cool seeing that. Um, they, there was a lot of randoms, too, that they were calling out to the field. Random 90s, you know, <laughs> journeymen. Uh, I guess they couldn't get everybody there. I know guys like Bernie had to get surgery, and there were other guys who couldn't make it, but a lot of randoms who not even my dad knew, and that's saying something because he was a big Yankees fan back in the day. But they did, of course, um, honor the 1998 Yankees. Um, you know, they had them all doing the press conference in their uniforms. Pettit was up there, Jeter... Uh, Posada, Mariano, Tori. It was really cool seeing that. Um, they had a couple guys in the booth during the pregame. I, uh, you know, Tori was in the booth talking, and he was saying how back in '98, uh, or I don't know if it was '98. It was one of the years where they won a championship. They had a team meeting after a one and four start. And when I heard that, I was just I, I'm thinking to myself. That is such a far gone tactic. Like from this current Yankee regime. They would never do something like that. This current Yankees team was telling you it's going to be okay. Everything's great. La la la. Dandy dandy. In August. When they were below 500. And in last place. And still in the race at the time. They were telling you everything was great. That team had a team meeting. Tory was on the verge of getting canned. Or in rumors, I should say, after a 1-4 and four start in April. And I love that, by the way. I'm not dissing that. I think that's the way to go. Overreact. Be, be insanely urgent like that. That's how you win championships, apparently. They were asking Jeter... In that little press conference in the media room, what would Jeter? They asked him what would he say to this struggling Yankees group, and his response was perfect: "Win, 
Jeter, what would you say to this group? Win. That's it. That's all you need to say. That's all you absolutely need to say. Win. David Wells was there. He had some interesting comments. Um, it was weird because he was like, I don't know. He's not going to throw the Yankees under the bus on Old Timers Day while he was welcomed back to the stadium. I get that. But he was talking about the current Yankees and he was saying how he doesn't blame Cashman or Boone. But then he went on to call the players soft, coddled, and he said that struggling Yankees needed to be sent down. So it's like, well, that's Cashman and Boone right there, soft, coddled, and not being sent down when you need to be. So it didn't really make a ton of sense. And then he had the whole... I don't know. He went on a rant about politics and like he had the white tape over the Nike logo because, you know, I don't know, Republicans and China and Nike and shit. And he was talking about Bud Light and that they them person and the fucking, you know, he went off on like woke culture and shit. He, he was just and I'm sitting here. I'm like, well, you know, if Boomer is not the perfect nickname for David Wells, then, you know, it's perfect. Boomer, Boomer Wells is his nickname and it makes perfect sense. All right, I'm trying to procrastinate because I don't want to talk about the elephant in the room here because I'm going to be depressed on Sunday night. But we skipped last series, um, took a break after that Tigers episode, uh, Tigers series, where the Yankees did take two out of three. Um, they dropped the final game in a very ugly way, but they did take two from Detroit. Uh, I think I handed out, or I was going to, um, I think Torres, Cole, and Holmes are the ones who I give cap tips to. Um, but let's talk about this series. Let's 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 not waste further time. Um, on Friday, the Yankees lost to the Brewers, eight to two. Severino versus Raya, Raya. Uh, in the bottom of the third, uh, Jason Dominguez does it again. Uh, hits the two-run home run to put them up 2-0. That'd be his final for a while. Uh, top of the fourth, Severino, of course, gives it back because that's what he does. Adamas hits the two-run home run, ties it. Fifth inning, Sevy leaves the game injured. Brito comes in. Seventh and eighth inning, it all falls apart for the Yankees. Loisica comes in. He gets lit up. Greg Weiser comes in. Ground balls galore getting through the infield. He gets lit the fuck up. And all of a sudden, it's 8-2 Milwaukee, and that was your final score. The Yankees get two runs on three hits, nine strikeouts, and go 0 for 9 in scoring position. Judge, Dominguez, and Peraza, the only three Yankees with the hit. Judge also had two walks. Peraza, double, and Dominguez, two RBIs from the home run. And yeah. It sucks. Severino. Um, four plus innings, two runs, four hits, a walk, five strikeouts, and what is most likely his final Yankees game. Um, leaves injured. He officially threw his last pitch in pinstripes. And it's just, it sucks. It's a tough way to go out. Um, they're calling it a high grade oblique strain. Uh, he's going to be on the DL the rest of the year. It's tough uh, for him. It's sad the way this whole thing panned out. But I'm kind of glad it's over. I needed this to be over. Um, yeah. This this couldn't go on for much longer. Like, I'm happy. I, I'm very glad that this... <clears throat> Severino experiment is is done with. Um, the bullpen, Brito was okay for a couple innings before he gave up the double. Weiser and Loisaga were awful. Canely was fine, but by then it was over. Uh, two errors in this game. Defensively, Severino made one and Bowers. Uh, Saturday, game two, the Yankees uh, lost this game. Um, Michael King versus Wade Miley. 
Uh, this was again the old timers day. Uh, it was there was a rain delay that lasted a bit. It was supposed to be a 2:05 game, but the delay lasted until 4:40. Uh, in the top of the first and second, King looking dominant out the gate. He gets four consecutive strikeouts to begin the game, all of them swinging. Four-seamer, sinker, slider. The slider was working great. Bottom of the third, the Yankees almost get on the board. Kinda. But Judge drove one deep to left field, but it was more of a crowd overreaction plus K being fooled and dramatic once again. Uh, it was a fly ball out. Uh, top of the fourth, the Yankees do the thing where they show how incompetent they are defensively. Um, you have the one-out single to Mark Kana. Uh, you have the Little League home run allowed to Adamas. It was out to Stanton in right field. Stanton plays it terribly off the wall. Finally gets it to the infield, but DJ LeMayu makes a horrendous throw to third base. The ball goes past Adamas. Um... Not Adamas. The ball goes past third base, and Adamas rounds third, and he ends up scoring. So all of a sudden, it's two nothing Milwaukee. Um, the Yankees do tie the game in the bottom, of the, in the bottom of the fourth inning, though, when um, Milwaukee just playing terrible defense. Glaber has the one out walk. Stanton reaches on the fielder's choice from the E six. Um, Volpe rips an RBI single past shortstop for the Yankees' first hit of the night or day. And it's 2-1. to one, And that Pereira gets an RBI in the fielder's choice from uh, to shortstop. Behind some more bad defense from Milwaukee. And it's 2-2. Two to two. Um, Michael King escapes a jam to finish five innings in the fifth. Uh, he lets up a base hit to the number eight hitter. The guy advances to second base when King steps off the mound a third time and doesn't end up getting the runner on the pickoff. So that advances the runner with the new rules. Um, but he gets two strikeouts after that to end the inning. Sixth inning, Weiser is in for King. Peralta got the seventh. And in the eighth, Lasagna's in. It's a tie game at the time, uh, but he continues to struggle. And he gives up the lead immediately. Taylor, the leadoff home run on the second pitch he saw, it's 3-2. to two. And then he surrenders four consecutive singles, five hits in a row. Uh, some of them were hard hit, but the majority of them were blue pits. Um, regardless, it's 4-2 Milwaukee. You get the pinch hit sack fly from Caratini. Um, my uncle knows him. Uh, it's 5-2 Milwaukee. And then the top of the ninth, uh, it gets even messier with Matt Crook and Ron Marinaccio, who was called back up and then sent back down after this in the game. Uh, Crook couldn't get a single out. Uh, Marinaccio comes in. He's walking batters at the bases, loaded a couple times. And all of a sudden, you look up and the Yankees lose 9-2. Uh, two runs on four hits. They were one for six in scoring position. Judge, Volpe, Pereira, Peraza, each with a hit. Um, Dominguez had a rough, rough day at the plate in his final game of the year. 0 for 4, 3 strikeouts. Um, the Yankee Bats overall just dead, no energy. Didn't look like there was a ton of effort. Um, Michael King, we'll talk more on him later, but he won 5 innings, 2 runs, 1 earned run, 4 hits, a walk, and 9 strikeouts. Uh, and the bullpen, four innings, eight runs combined. They completely melted down once again. Um, the, 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 the Yankee fundamentals in the ninth inning were terrible too. All throughout the game, the Yankee fundamentals were piss poor. I mean, you had errors, balks, pitching violations, bad communication. King almost chucked one into center field because Glaber didn't cover second. You had a lot of miscommunication in the outfield. Stanton, Dominguez, Dominguez with Pereira in left field. It was very disgusting, but also very predictable because that's what the Yankees do. They're incompetent fundamentally. And then game three. Today, the Yankees lost, or they won. They picked up a 4-3 victory in extra innings, 13 innings. Felt like a loss because of the news we're going to touch on in a second, but Cole went up against Corbin Burns, who I've wanted before this season. Uh, Dominguez was a late scratch with the right elbow inflammation, and we find out later about Again, what we will get on in a few minutes. Uh, top of the second, it looked ugly for a second. You had a couple of base hits and then a wild pitch. That put runners on second and third. I think Cole threw 27 pitches in the inning, if I'm correct, but he ends up escaping it. Top of the fourth, Pereira makes a nice play in left field after misreading a fly ball. Ends up recovering and, and getting a good play going back. 
Uh, top of the fifth, Garrett Cole records his 200th strikeout on the season by getting Monasterio to go down swinging. Uh, it was his third 200 strikeout season with the Yankees, most from a Yankees starting pitcher of all time. Um, and, you know, could have been fourth, but remember the, the first year Garrett Cole came here was during the COVID schedule. Um... And in the bottom of the fifth, the Yankees finally get their first base runner as Corbin Burns was perfect through four. Uh, Stanton draws a walk. IKF then reaches on a fielder's choice. Pereira walks, uh, but the Yankees end up leaving two runners on. Uh, sixth inning, Cole gets a strike three to end the inning. The ball gets by Rohrfed. He makes an excellent throw to get the runner. Um, and that was it for, I don't know, Cole, I think, won seven. Yeah, he won, he won one more. He goes seven. Uh, Peralta, Holmes, Canely, Ramirez, and then some random who I never heard of before go the rest of the way. Uh, Burns goes eight despite pitching a no-hitter. He had 109 pitches through eight, uh, but they did not put him back out for the ninth. Uh, tenth inning, Volpe almost ties the game, but the ball was caught on a very nice play from the right fielder. Him and the center fielder actually collide. Uh, that was a little scary. But the Yanks still didn't have a single hit in this game through 10 innings. I mean, it has to be close to a record, if not a record. Um, 11th inning, Milwaukee scores first. Taylor rips the RBI single off Ramirez, because that's what Ramirez does. Gives up runs. 11th inning, bottom of the 11th inning. The Yanks finally get their first hit and their first run. It comes off the bat of Oswaldo who rips an RBI double to score the fake base runner from second. Uh, that was the only hit of the inning for the Yankees, but they did strand a few guys after that. Um, it makes it 1-1. to -one. 12th inning, Nick Ramirez, for his second inning of work, goes back out there, and he gives the Brewers two more runs. Double, sack fly, it's 3-1. to -one. 12th inning, I had the feeling this was over. Just seemed dead. There was no energy. The crowd quieted down. But then Stanton home run. A two-run shot to dead center. It's a tie game at three. Um, the fact that it was it was a game-tying home run kind of made me less optimistic. Um, but the Yankees did walk it off in the bottom of the 13th when Higashioka uh, slugged the RBI double. So, the Yankees end up winning four to three. Four runs on three hits and 15 strikeouts in 13 innings. Um, Stanton, the home run, Oswaldo, the double, and then Higashioka, the double. Those are the only three hits. Cole, seven innings, no runs, three hits, no walks, nine strikeouts, uh, no home runs, 106 pitches, and the no decision. The curveball looked great, especially in the seventh inning. A lot of break to it. Uh, had a, there was that big looping inside knuckle curve that he threw, got for a strike that was nice. Had a lot of swing and miss throughout the game. Uh, so he looked good. Let's talk about Jason. When we return from break, stay with us here in the podcast. Episode 558 of BD4. Let's go. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 558. Jason Dominguez is done. <clears throat> um, again, the right elbow inflammation. That did not sound good when I heard that this morning. After the game, or sometime late in the game, we find out, well, this was after the game, we find out it's a UCL tear. And that he will be getting Tommy John surgery. So he's out. I've heard anywhere from 6 to 10 weeks. So that's that's not saying much. It's not very precise. Um, depends where you look. I mean the Yankees. With, with, with their injuries. Uh, they've had position players. Go down with Tommy John. More than I've ever seen. Torres. Gregorius. Hicks, 
all over the last few seasons. This is amazing. This injury shit cannot be happening by next year. Figure this shit out. And I think there are two ways to do it. You fire the entire training staff again. The medical people... Again, it's crazy that I'm saying it again. Because I think they tried that a couple years ago. Did they not? The medical people, the team doctors, anything to do with well-being, health, ASAP. Fire them all into the sun. Get rid of their stench. And, also, find a way. Find a way to move some of these older, injury-prone players. Find a way. I don't care. I'm not the GM. That's your job, Brian Cashman. Gotta move Stanton. If it's possible, you have to do it. You have got to find a partner for Anthony Rizzo. Try to find a partner for DJ LeMayu. Find a partner for any other one of those brittle, unhealthy nuisances as soon as absolute possible. Because this shit, it's got to end. I am done with guys just getting hurt every single second and hope anytime you have a little bit of positivity, nope, not going to happen because he's the next one to go down for a bit. And it just, it sucks for the kid too. Don't get me wrong. It sucks. The 20 year old kid, he's, he's been here since he was 16. Finally gets his shot at big league ball. He's this young phenom, the next big thing, the next mantle. Every time the camera panned to him, the kid was grinning, smiling his ass off, having a great time out there. He was so happy to be here. He was the only reason Yankees fans were watching at this point. And now that that's over, for this year and probably next year, why do I care? Why should you care? To think that five games ago, we were just starting to talk once again about a playoff spot. And now we're here. It's insane. We can't have good things. And it's this organization's fault. Now we're here. We're the only bright spot left. Was, was hey, look, the Martian. He looks amazing. He has four home runs out there. He had as many as RB, RBIs as he had games played. Now, boom, that's over with. So, I don't know what's next. I don't know what the timetable is going to be again. It could be, I don't know. I, I Again, I've heard anywhere from six to ten months, depending on where you look. I remember Gregorius got surgery from his Tommy John um, in, in October. And he came back in June. So, is that eight months? November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. That's eight months. Um, recently, this, not Yankees, but Bryce Harper, he got the Tommy John last year. He also came back very soon. But again, he only DH'd, and the Yankees already have a DH, one who can't move his lower body, so that's not happening. I don't think, I, I, I we're not seeing Dominguez play DH. And Harper's power numbers were also pretty brutal. For a while, too. I know he wasn't hitting home runs. I don't know what he's doing now. But I, I just feel like with the Yankees, they're going to be extremely conservative with it. That's what they do with their injury, guys. They And if they have an excuse to not play Jason Dominguez at all next year, I could definitely see them doing that. If there is one thing, we need them to get the surgery like right away then. Like if it was possible tonight. And it sucks because he already lost a year of development time during the COVID season because they didn't have a minor league season. So now he's going to lose another year next year. So it's like, yeah, of course, we know he's got the raw tools to be legitimate. And, and, and yeah, he was killing it, but it was eight games, eight games. So it's not like we got a large sample size to be certain about him or close to certain. Like anybody talented or talentless can have an elite eight-game stretch. So even if he comes back next year, he'll have to rehab in the minors, slowly revamp, and he won't be 100% until, what, a month or two after returning anyway, if even. So, as for this year, I, I guess there's nothing else that can excite me. I mean, we're probably going to see Esteban Florio get a shot. If you're into him, great. <laughs> 
but it makes things interesting heading into 2024 now. Um, I don't think that makes it any different. I think you still have to do what you, what you sh should have done with Dominguez healthy. You should still plan on signing Bellinger. The only thing this does is make it more of a must. It's a must of all musts that you sign Cody Bellinger at this point. It was already a must before. I don't know what it makes that now. And the shitty part is supply and demand. Because Boris damn well is going to be ripping the Yankees off now. If the Yankees want Cody Bellinger, there will be an overpay at this point. And if I'm to guess, I'm expecting that figure to start with the number two. I'm just saying. But I'm doing it. So, you get Cody Bellinger, you have him play center field, and I don't know what they do in left. Maybe Pereira starts hitting, he plays left field for you next year. I don't know. they got to figure this out. And to make matters worse about this, you know, when we're talking about optimism for 2024, storylines, the same time this Dominguez news hits, we're starting to worry about a couple other guys. Because we got guys, all of a sudden, Volpe not hitting a lick, DJ LeMayhew not hitting a lick. The DJ one is a little more concerning to me because he's a lot older. He's on the decline. He hasn't been too productive or healthy the last three, four seasons now. We had the whole... Sean Casey thing riding for a bit. He was hitting well over 300 since the All-Star break, which was when Casey came in. And now he's not hitting again. Uh, he was 0 for 12 this series. He's won for his last 15. He didn't get a single hit this series. Uh, I'm not easy. It's it's small sample. Um, I didn't get that. Hold on. Could you try again? I got this bitch Siri talking to me. I don't know how to respond to that. That's funny. Okay. Um, how do I get rid of that? Whatever. I'm kind of lost. Um, I got my other, my other monitor open. And you know who is talking to me. Um, yeah, where am I? He's not hitting, DJ. Um, again, small sample. Still has time to get back on track, but remember, I do need him to continue hitting before the season ends because, you know, I'm open to bringing him back as a utility guy with less playing time coming off the bench, but he needs to hit because I think no matter what, the Yankees, which is all that matters, they're going to start him. I feel like they're planning on starting him next season no matter what we see. So, he needs to have found something with Casey. And I hope this is just some bullshit cold spell. Uh, but Volpe starting to look very bad again. His batting average in OPS reached 219.706 at the end of August. But in September so far, across nine games, he's batting 118 with a 358 OPS. Again, small sample, but we need a long stretch of greatness for Volpe at this point. The uppercut is still there right now. He's launching a lot of balls in the air that could have been line drives. Like that one hit today, the flyout that ended up being caught in that collision. That needed to be a line drive double. But launch angle, right? Get it in the air. And as soon as it came off the bat, I said, oh, that's too high. He needs to work on that line drive approach. Um... And yeah, he needed a hot September because I don't want to go into an offseason with Volpe as a big question mark. And right now, I think we're going to. And listen, I'm kind of done thinking this kid can be a superstar. I don't think he's the next Jeter. The whole Jeter thing got people thinking, including myself at one point, that he was this 300 hitter who put the ball in play and was going to be, you know, a 300 bat. But the fact is the matter, but the fact of the matter is that Anthony Volpe strikes out a ton. Can he cut those down? Sure. But I think he's always going to be a guy who strikes out. Uh, and I think he has good power. I think he's got good speed. I think he's got a clutch gene. I think he's got a good glove to where if he does work on some things in the winter, if he works with Sean Casey, if he stays away from the nerds and launch angle and the exit velo bullshit 
and he focuses on line drives going the other way, and he just continues to improve situational hitting and things like that, then I still think he could be a solid-ass player. Like, I still think that someday, if Anthony Volpe works on all that shit, he could be a guy that gives you a 250 average, 25 homers, 25 stolen bases, and 800 OPS, and, and good defense. And if that's the case, that's an absolute win, especially for a shortstop. That's a win. You take that. But we got to see more. And it's plenty fair to criticize him. Like, if you're still sucking up to everybody because they're a rookie, they're young, or they're paid little money, or whatever the excuse is, because if you nitpick enough, you'll find an excuse for literally anything. It's possible to do that. But if you're doing all that still with these players, then, then, then you should probably stop complaining about when the Yankees lose because it's you that's accepting poor results. It's very hypocritical to do that. You're allowed to criticize anybody. This is the Yankee shortstop for the next X amount of years. This is their guy. They literally passed up on the most stacked up, loaded, talented shortstop market two years in a row because of Anthony Volpe, a former top prospect in their system and also all of baseball. So excuse me if I expect a little something more next season from him. So... Sorry, but the Dominguez just threw the whole vibe off. I'm, like, not in the best of moods when it comes to the Yankees. Um, some positives. The Yankees sent top executives to go and watch uh, Yamamoto pitch the other day. They sent Cashman, Hal, and um, Omar Minaya to go watch Yamamoto throw a no-hitter while they were in attendance. Um, we've spoken last time on him. This was a couple episodes ago about Yamamoto, how there were a lot of teams in on him. Uh, it's probably going to come down to the bigger market teams, the, the teams on the East Coast, and obviously on the West with the Dodgers maybe, and the Red Sox and the Mets. Obviously, Cohen's got the money. Uh, but I, I, th I still think this kid is an absolute must. With Carlos Rodon looking the way he does, Cortez is a question mark. Yamamoto almost becomes a must. He is a must. We talked about him the other day. We, we you know, mid 90s heater. He's got a solid cut fastball, a filthy curveball, throws a changeup, and he's got an excellent splitter. He's going for his third MVP and I believe his third triple crown. He's touted as the greatest pitcher in Japan right now and possibly ever. Um, high IQ pitcher. He can fill this position. They all can. They're very fundamentally sound over there, man. So I think you have to grab them. You have to sign Yamamoto, regardless of the price. Go spend and be the Yankees. Grab Yamamoto. He's a 25-year-old. He'll be part of your future. That's part of your core. Make out your rotation with Cole, Rodon, because he's stuck here, Yamamoto, Michael King, possibly in Clark, in Clark Schmidt. Speaking of Michael King, another topic we could talk about. Should the Yankees keep Michael King in this role? I've, yeah, I've not really tapered from that yet. I like it. He won five innings in this series. Allowed one run. Earned run. Um, he hasn't thrown 80 pitches yet. So he, he keeps progressing. Though. He's getting closer and closer. He continues to climb the ladder as he gets stretched out. But it makes sense. The arsenal is there. The stuff is there. That sweeping slider of his. That and the two-seamer at 94. That's his main one-two combo. He's also got a hard four-seam fastball. It's his tertiary pitch and the occasional changeup. He's got the arsenal. The results look better each time he steps on the mound too. So far this season when King starts, and remember some of these are opens because they're building him up, five games 18 two thirds innings, 24 strikeouts, a 193 ERA, and a 107 whip. But that leads me to my question. It's like, is. So if Michael King is like a number five starter at best, would we prefer that or Michael King, the elite reliever? Because if this. If, if his ceiling is a number five, I'm definitely preferring Michael King out of the bullpen. 
But I'm starting to believe more start the more starts we see from him. And I'm getting excited because I'm pretty sure soon we're gonna see him reach hundred pitches. I'm starting to believe that he could probably be he probably has more upside. He could probably be a solid number three. And if that's the case, I'm keeping him in the in the rotation. That's my guy. I think that's the only way it's worth taking him out of the bullpen and putting him into the rotation is if he's got number three pitcher upside. And and I'm not denying that. And I think that's I think that's very possible. Um, I got my new mic today, but I need to. I ordered the new. I had to order another um, piece for it before I can start using it. So that's why I'm using this temporary piece of shit. Um, yeah, Michael King. Interesting, to say the least. And I think that's it. We'll we'll wrap this up with our. Uh, We'll tip our caps when we return from break. Stay with us here on BD4 episode 558 of the podcast. Be right back. The New York Giants are getting their asses kicked. 40 to 0. Wow. Um I don't know why my computer is freezing up. That's annoying. The fuck? The fuck is happening here? Um, oh my god. Hold on. Alright, let's hand down our tip of the cap. Let's tip our caps. Uh, Aaron Judge, we're tipping our caps to him for the ninth time this season, tying Anthony Volpe for most among position players. Uh, not been hitting for power lately, not really getting any home runs. RBIs, but he did get on base six times in the series. Two hits, four walks. Garrett Cole, tipping my caps to Garrett Cole. Again, seven innings, no runs. Probably going to win the Cy Young. I love that he works with Rortfed very passionately. He keeps yelling at him. Uh, there was uh, in the seventh inning, when I think it was the seventh inning, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Sometime in this game. It was before the seventh. It was sometime in the game. Rortfett drops third, uh, drops strike three, and Garrett Cole just like walking off the mound, doesn't even break stride. He's like, you know, you better get this throw at the first in time. Uh, they have an interesting relationship. It's fun. Um, it's interesting because you know I I want to see how he looks with Wells, but I thought that was coming after. I don't know. Maybe we'll see one. I want to see what he looks like with Austin Wells. Um, it's kind of important. I was hoping that that was what they used September for. Their catcher of the future to see how he looked with their ace. I mean, what's the point of using a personal catcher in meaningless exhibition games, right? But it's called 17th cap tip most on the team. Wandy Peralta, two innings, no runs, a strikeout, a walk, no hits this series. Continues to pitch well. He's reliable. The Yanks will use him in any role. Lefty on lefty, lefty versus righty because he's got a nice changeup that goes well and inside on the righties. Um, and it's his fifth cap tip this year. So that's it. We'll head to our final break, wrap it up with our trivia. That'll be that. Let's get to it.
<clears throat> All right, so for this episode, episode 558 of the podcast, my question to you, alongside Jason Dominguez, who was the only other Yankee to hit at least three home runs in his first five games with the team? Alongside Jason Dominguez, who was the only other Yankee to hit at least three home runs in his first five games with the team? Let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I will give you a shout out in the next episode. As for this episode, that's it. Episode 558 is in the books. I appreciate you tuning in and stopping by. Um, yep. Not good. Uh, can't say I'll be plenty of invested uh, in these final few games here. Two weeks, whatever we got. <clears throat> I'm waiting for the Knicks. I'm excited about the Knicks, and the Knicks should be fun. So, that's it. And, of course, the UFC just got a whole lot interesting after that Strickland fight. Woo! All right. Thank you. I'll see you next time.